Let me ask you a question. Do puzzles cause headaches in your classroom? Do your kids seem completely uninterested in puzzles? Or maybe they're frustrated because they just can't put the puzzles together. And don't even get me started on all those missing pieces. If you think puzzles are too much of a hassle or they're too old school for kids today, think again. In this episode, I'll be sharing my best tips and tricks for teaching smarter, not harder, when it comes to using puzzles in the classroom and how to set your kids up for success by following the developmental sequence that nobody taught you in college. Now, I remember my very first year teaching public pre-kindergarten. Now, we had puzzles in the classroom, but my kids showed zero interest in using them. And then when I showed them how to put the puzzles together, they just stared at me. And those few kids who did try to put a puzzle together were completely frustrated and they just gave up. The reason my students showed no interest in puzzles is because they had no prior exposure or experience to them. And the puzzles that I did have out, they were way too difficult for their age. There are three distinct types of experiences young children may have or may not have had with puzzles when they enter your preschool classroom. Some of your students may have puzzles at home and they may have been playing with them at home since they were toddlers, while others may have never even seen a puzzle, let alone played with one before. And then there are those kids who have exposure to puzzles only on a flat screen, right? So they may have been playing on a smartphone or an iPad playing some puzzle games. And that's a completely different type of puzzle experience, right? Each type may need different puzzles, which we'll get into shortly. For example, when my nephew was five, he was already putting together 30 piece jigsaw puzzles on his own. But in my own pre-K class of four to five year olds, my students were not at that level. So different children need different puzzles at different times. So that brings me to the reason why puzzles are definitely not old school. You see, puzzles can actually help young children develop skills across many different domains. Some skills that are being developed when young children are playing with puzzles are number one, executive function skills. Yes, that's right. One of the most critical skills to be developed in the early childhood years and beyond, right? These are things kids are gonna need for the rest of their lives. And those are things like critical thinking, problem solving, attention spans and concentration, right? We're stretching them. Spatial awareness, right? Flipping and turning pieces around where things belong in space. Visual discrimination, does this piece fit in this shape here? and visual memory, that is remembering where the puzzles go in the picture. And number two are fine water skills, of course. We need those embedded into everything we do in preschool all day long. And some of the types of fine water skills are hand-eye coordination. So our eye is seeing something and our hand has to go in and manipulate the piece to match what our eye is seeing or telling us. And of course, as children are grasping onto the pegs or the knobs and the puzzles, they're also developing a lot of those fine motor skills in their hands. And lastly, number three, are academic skills. And so this is more of an added benefit of puzzles. And the reason why you see so many puzzles with an academic twist on them is because you can kill a lot of birds with one stone. So for example, you have your shape puzzles, you have your color puzzles, you have your alphabet puzzles, number puzzles. There is even nursery rhyme puzzles for literacy and phonological awareness. Now that we know the many benefits of playing with puzzles, next, let's turn our attention to those different types of puzzles and the time or the age at which they're introduced. When it comes to using puzzles in the classroom with young children, there are a few things to keep in mind. Number one, is how sturdy the puzzle is. And number two is the age of the child playing with it. Because let's face it, when you have an entire class of young children, right? And then double that number because they each have two hands. <laughs> it can take, puzzles can take rather a real beating. That's why when it comes to using puzzles with young children ages four and under, I recommend using wooden puzzles. Next, as promised, here's the developmental progression of puzzle skills that most young children will follow. It's important to keep these stages in mind when selecting puzzles to put out 
in your preschool classroom. But before I get into that, I want to remind our listeners and viewers that the ages and stages of development that I'm referring to in this episode and on this podcast in general are for typically developing children. For children who have delays, there will need to be modifications made. So the first type of puzzle is the peg puzzle or the knob puzzle, depending on the exact age of the child. And so this type of puzzle has a little knob or a peg on the top of each piece. And these are typically used by children ages two to three, right? After that, most children uh, will move on to another type of puzzle, which we'll get to in a moment. And so these were, these are things I like to call the chunky knobs for the younger child, the younger the child, the bigger the knob, right? Because they haven't really developed the um, dexterity in their fingers and hands to actually lift the pieces up without the assistance of the knob. So that's one of the modifications you would need to make if you were working with children in a special education program. So these chunky puzzles for typically developing children, age two, will have a chunky knob on top. In addition to the chunky knob or the peg, that's for when the children are closer to three, they will also have a picture underneath the space where the puzzle piece goes so that the child is grasping the piece and picking it up, right? Usually they dump it over, right? So they get the flat puzzle, they dump it over on the ground, and then they see the pictures are still there, but the pieces are over here and they lift the pieces up and they try to match them to the spot. So it's a very simple beginning stage puzzle for a very young child. And then and when they get closer to three, the knobs start turning into little pegs. They're much um, more difficult to grasp as their fingers in their hands, um, the muscles in their hands in their fingers rather start to develop. So that brings us to simple picture inset puzzles. <laughs> it's a whole mouthful, but what it really means is that once young children have mastered the knob or the peg puzzles, right, and they're ready to move on, that next stage is a puzzle without the pegs or the knobs. And it still has, though, the picture in the inset for matching purposes. So for example, you might see this type of a puzzle have a little extra groove, empty groove around the edge so the child can easily get their finger in and pull the piece out because that's what trips up a lot of children at that stage. So these are going to reduce frustration a great deal. So when it comes to your two to three-year-olds, chunky knobs and pegs are the way to go. Next up are picture inset puzzles. Now these are very simple puzzles with about six or so pieces that complete a basic picture. And for those of you listening along, I'm showing some examples on the screen. If you would like to see them, you can hop over to our Elevating Early Childhood podcast um, on YouTube. But as you can see here, I'm taking out these pieces of the puzzle. This is um, Hey Diddle Diddle Puzzle from Lakeshore Learning. And I'm taking out the pieces. And now you can see there's still some elements of the puzzle that are visible, but mostly what the child is gonna be doing is recreating the picture. There's a few pieces that are um, always there, not this one. And the words are on the bottom. I really like this set. now. If you know anything about Lakeshore Learning, you know that they keep their products fresh. So they have, have probably redesigned this several times since I bought these. These aren't terribly old. Um, they're less than 10 years old. And because they're wood, they're sturdy wood, um, they last for a long time. I find that their puzzles, wooden puzzles in general, tend to last a long time. But I like Lakeshore's because they tend to be very bright and vibrant and also educational at the same time. So as you can see with this particular wooden puzzle, they're putting the pictures in the slots, right? Where they belong, starting with the outer and going to the inner. And sometimes they're a lot harder than they actually look. <laughs> I've had to clean up many in my time. So it can be a challenge, especially if you're in a big rush. So just think about how the kids feel then in that, in that regard. I've always had a little tiny problem with this cow. He just needs very, very fine tuning when you get to that part, but there you go. So that is um, 
a puzzle from Lakeshore Learning. They come in a set. They look a little different now. This one's less than 10 years old, but they tend to change them up. Um, I really like this set though. And I have all of the different um, nursery rhymes in this particular set, which is also great for those literacy and phonological awareness skills because when they complete the puzzle, um, then they have to say the rhyme to another adult in the room, whether that's me or my assistant or volunteer or whatever. So that's a picture insert puzzle. And those are good for children ages four to five, depending on their ability levels. So in my public pre-kindergarten classroom, where none of my students had any prior exposure or practice with using puzzles, those were perfect for my group of children. So that brings me to interlocking puzzles. Now these look more like the traditional puzzles we as adults think of, right? They have the little pieces that go together, the little rounded edges that fit into the other ones that have the empty edge and then you create a picture it, within a uh, frame perhaps, but there's no guidance as to where the uh, pieces should go other than the frame, right? So a lot of times we see these wooden frames, they've got all the pieces in the middle put together. And then when you take the pieces out, there's nothing there but a blank piece of wood with the edges around it to contain the puzzle. This is really helpful as children are learning how to use puzzles because then they can start from the edges and they can see that the flat edges go along the outside and the, um, the places where there's the 90 degree angle, you know, they can really see that and it helps things take shape and, and into focus for them. Now, when I refer to these interlocking puzzles, I'm not talking about a 30 piece puzzle like my nephew was doing at the age of five. I'm talking more about um, a puzzle in a frame that has those traditional pieces we think of, but is really only uh, like four to eight pieces at the most. And that brings me to interlocking puzzles with, you guessed it, no base. So we went from chunky knob puzzles to peg puzzles to the puzzles that complete a picture with the outline of the shape. And then we moved on to the interlocking puzzles within a frame with a base. Now we're moving to the interlocking puzzles without a base. And that would be your typical jigsaw or in the preschool classroom, I like to think of those as floor puzzles, right? Because your smaller jigsaws with more than 30 pieces each, that's going to be too difficult to manage in any preschool classroom because there's a lot of pieces and they're not going to be able to get those done quickly. So cleanup is going to be really tricky there. Um, I'm not saying you can't do them. I'm saying to just be very mindful of that. Um, and it, they can be very problematic because they can be frustrating for young children. So I like to use floor puzzles in this case. So when your kids have mastered the basic puzzle thing, right? They're not using the knobs or the pegs and they're not reliant upon the picture outlines and they don't need the picture inset to help them place the pieces. Then we move on to those interlocking puzzles within the frame and then move on to the floor puzzles. And I love floor puzzles for many reasons, a lot of them being the collaborative aspect of them. So that brings me to my favorite part of this episode, and that is the troubleshooting tips and tricks that I'm going to share with you that I encountered in my own classroom in ways that you can overcome these in your classroom very quickly and easily. So first up, we have my puzzle storage solution. And so you may have noticed before, if you're watching along, um, I have these trays. I purchased these letter trays from Ikea a while ago, and they are designed to, you know, hold letters like you would on a regular office desk. And my secret is that these puzzles fit perfectly on them. So I just stack them up. I stack up three at a time, and I have two trays of three side by side on my shelves. So it's very easy for the kids to put the puzzles away, right? Those wire racks are just horrible and they frustrate children. They're really made for just storing puzzles, not for children who are using the puzzles to put away. So if you want your puzzles to be a hot mess, then use a wire puzzle rack. If not, I highly recommend these letter trays. Another trick that I've learned over the years that helps combat the whole 
I don't know which puzzle this piece belongs to because you, sometimes you get puzzle soup, right? And sometimes you're the one who discovers the puzzle soup after the kids have gone home. So you have to put them together yourself. And one thing that I have found for me that really helps is to make sure that you know which puzzle pieces go to which puzzle because that was one of my biggest frustrations in my classroom was sometimes I would find quote unquote puzzle soup after the kids went home and it was up to me to put all the puzzles back. Otherwise I knew we would just have lost pieces. And so the way that you can combat that really simply and easily is to take the puzzle pieces out of a puzzle. So just one puzzle, turn the pieces over and then write a symbol on the back of each puzzle piece in that particular puzzle. So here we have, this is just something quick and easy that I can make. That's a starburst. If you're watching along, I'm making a starburst on the back of each of these puzzle pieces. And then when I have finished doing that, watch this. There is a matching symbol on the back of the puzzle frame. So now when the kids are cleaning up and they've got multiple puzzles out, because usually you have kids playing in multiple centers, all they have to do is remember that these are the pieces that go in this puzzle. So that is super helpful when it comes time for cleanup. So another thing that's really helpful that you can do using your Sharpie again, whatever Sharpie you chose for this puzzle, is to make sure that you know how many pieces go in this puzzle. So if you're left after school with puzzle soup on the floor, you can very quickly see, okay, I need 14 pieces for this puzzle or six pieces for that puzzle or whatever. If your students are using th these types of puzzles that don't have the actual picture to match on them. Um, this is gonna be super helpful <laughs> during your cleanup process or your storage process for the puzzles. So you're just going to, here's our puzzle frame. We've already marked our puzzle pieces with the starburst symbol. We got the starburst symbol that, there. Now we're going to count the pieces. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight pieces in this puzzle, and I am going to write the number eight. Now, this number helps me, but it can also help the children if your children are ready for that type of thing. Now, if you're using those simple uh, puzzles with uh, interlocking pieces in the frame or on the floor, it's super important that you have a picture of the finished puzzle to show your children. And my children in my classroom, ages four to five, could not put a floored puzzle together unless they had the top of the floor puzzle box to look at. Now I'm totally against using the floor puzzle box for storing the puzzle pieces because they're just garbage, but I do like to cut out the top portion of the lid and place it in a container, some kind of, um, I usually use a square like uh, Tupperware type containers to store my, my floor puzzles in. And I tape the cover of the puzzle from the box onto the top of the lid. That way when they're playing, they have something to reference because going from complete memory uh, to completion of a puzzle, there's two, those are two different skills, right? We're not looking for that with puzzles at that point. And my last troubleshooting tip isn't really a troubleshooting tip, but more of a piece of advice. And that is to put puzzles in every center of your classroom. And I think we all can agree that books should go in every center in our classroom because you can use books to reference anything, dramatic play, blocks, science, writing, any of that. You can use books in those centers. But I also highly recommend using puzzles in as many centers as you can. Maybe not dramatic play, but I like to have, um, and again, I usually use Lakeshore. There's a set of small half size counting puzzles. So again, they're wood and they have the, um, the cutout shape. It'll say five on the puzzle frame. And then looking for things that are groups of five to go into the slots on the tray. They have an alphabet set. I use those as well and a science set, which I also use. So I've got math, literacy or alphabet and science puzzles. So in three of my centers, I have puzzles that are out and uh, the alphabet ones, I don't put all 26 puzzles out at once. That's too many. So I usually will select several, you know, sets of six or something that I'll put out there. And you would be surprised. Children do put the puzzles together and Lakeshore has a lot of different ones. So you can decide um, which ones would work best for you. Uh, but really when it comes to science puzzles, there's very few out there to choose from.
The challenging part of making puzzles work for you in your classroom and for your kids are finding those just right Goldilocks type puzzles. Because if you put a puzzle out that's too easy, your children are going to quickly become bored and they're not going to want to play with puzzles. And if you put out a puzzle that's too hard, your kids will get frustrated and they also won't want to play with puzzles, right? So when you have those Goldilocks type just right puzzles, and you follow the sequence that I just laid out for you here, things will start to click. Your students will like to play with puzzles and they'll be learning important skills when doing so. I hope this episode of Elevating Early Childhood makes using puzzles in your classroom so much easier. Until next time, I'm Vanessa Levin. Onward and upward.